Armenia is under attack again for the first time in 30 years. This means a new generation of Armenians and Armenian diasporans are experiencing the existential panic of a home country literally under fire for the first time in their lifetime. Nonetheless, Armenians are used to facing tragedy in various forms, whether it's full-blown genocide, generations of refugees becoming globally dispersed or fighting to maintain our identities while simultaneously combating genocide denial. That's why every time you meet an Armenian, they make sure you know they're Armenian, because they fought to the brink to maintain that Armenianness. The intergenerational trauma is in our blood, and with it, inherited resilience. That very resilience was our survival at the face of genocide in 1915. That resilience was our survival in the Artsakh War upon the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. And that resilience will be our survival in the current crisis. A crisis thickened with a global pandemic, powerful dictatorships, and a cry for peace. We started this episode back in July, but found ourselves revising multiple times to keep up with our changing circumstances. This is a deep dive into the Artsakh struggle, our new reality, how we got here, and why it matters. I'm Krista Marina Apardian. And I'm Haig Minasian. And you're listening to High Tug Talks. Today's episode, The Struggle for Artsakh. <laughs> A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Artsakh has been recorded to be an integral part of the historic Armenian homeland since before Persian, Roman, or Turkish empires made their conquests towards historic Armenia. What's unique about Artsakh's history compared to the rest of Armenia is that up until the 17th century, there were Armenian nobles and princes who still had authority in Artsakh, while the rest of Armenia was completely subjugated. Depending on which empire these lands fell under, Turkic and Kurdish warlords would rule for a short period of time, so a process of eventual Turkification took place in the Caucasus as it did everywhere else a Turkish state existed. This is when the name Karabagh was designated to the land of Artsakh, which in Persian Turkish means Black Garden. We will be diving deeper into the history of Artsakh in an upcoming episode. Upon the forming of the Soviet Union in 1922, Stalin, in an effort to appease Turkey and sway them towards communism, placed Artsakh under the administration of Azerbaijan, a day after it was given to Armenia. Fast forward 75 years. By the time the Soviet Union fell in 1991, age-old ethnic tensions began to resurface as Armenians in Artsakh, the ethnic majority, desired to reunify with Armenia, angering the Azeris who reacted in the massacre and displacement of Armenians throughout Azerbaijan, most notably in Sumgait and Baku. Artsakh declared independence from Azerbaijan, Soviet Socialist Republic, just before the Republic of Azerbaijan declared its own independence, which was followed by a full-fledged war beginning in 1992. Soldiers started to come in. So, for instance, my great-grandma was home, and um, a soldier kind of, like, barged right into the house, and he was, like, obviously Azidi and knew that it was an Armenian family that was living there. And so, um, you know, it was like him and two other guys. So they beat her, they wrapped her arms up and then they said like, Hey, um, where are, you know, your jewelry, like really like valuable things, money, so on and so forth. Um, and she was like, I, I don't have anything. If you want, whatever it is, take whatever and leave. And, um, I don't know how graphic I'm allowed to be. But Turkey. basically, where uh, Armenians were desensitized <laughs> slash yeah. used to this stuff. But yeah. um, my great grandma had said that she was really thankful that she was actually wrapped up, and you know, because that meant that she wouldn't get raped. Yeah. So, um, and Which that happened, like, yeah, um, it happened. You know, people were getting burned in the streets. Yeah, man. Um, and it was like there was an account that I had read where it was basically a family was trying to identify their child that was burned via like their finger, you know, something like that, which is so insane to me. I mean, my family didn't go through or see anything too intense like that, but I know that a lot of other families did people they knew, you know, yeah, they grew up with. Yeah. You know, and my mom said like a lot of people she knew went missing to this day. I don't even think like she knew what happened to like, you know, some of her loved ones or even friends growing up. That was our friend guy in Parsegova who spoke to us about her mother's family's experience in surviving the pogroms of Baku in 1990, at the onset of the Artsakh conflict 30 years ago. 
After the war, the OSCE Minsk Group was created in an attempt to establish peace in the region, a region with a peaceful, democratically elected government and a 99.7% Armenian population. The group includes members from the US, France, and Russia, who was the one who brokered a ceasefire in 1994. But despite the ceasefire, violations and clashes have occurred regularly over the years, instigated by Azerbaijan, in an attempt to keep the conflict alive. All the while, Azerbaijan has been waiting for the last 30 years to build up their army and wait for the right time to strike. Two particularly notable clashes mark the largest escalations up to this point, 2016 and July 2020. There is the possibility of war at every second because um, psychologically, I mean, I was not surprised that the war happened. In 2016, I was surprised, Mm -hmm. but now not. That was historian and researcher Yeria Tashchan from Beirut, who we interviewed back in August after the July skirmish. Yeria Tashyan is a regional analyst and researcher with a focus on various topics from minority rights to regional security and energy issues. He founded the New Eastern Politics Forum blog in 2010, which I've been in since then, and is currently the regional officer of Women in War, a gender-based think tank. He is a contributor to the various local and regional newspapers and presenter of the Turkey Today program and Radio Voice of On. Little did we know, two months later, that possibility of war would come into full fruition. We also spoke to Gev Iskadjian about this new reality. Gev Iskadjian is a lifelong activist and a current board member of the ANCA, the Armenian National Committee of America, Western Region. Gev is also an AYF alum. During his time with the org, he helped launch Divest Turkey, an initiative that works to divest funds between California universities and the Turkish government. Gev also played a pivotal role in planning the March for Justice on the centennial of the Armenian Genocide in 2015 a march of 160,000 Armenians, spearheaded by the Armenian Genocide Committee in which the AYF played an essential role. Gev is also a former Haitug magazine editor, so it's certainly full circle to have him on our first episode. I do believe that there was a certain timeliness to Azerbaijan starting this military escalation in this war, Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe it was done understanding that we live in a time of pandemic, we live in a time of somewhat of a global crisis, and the voices of small nations and small conflicts do not bear as much weight, whereas if there was a lull in the news stream. Right. But today, there's a crisis every day, and they understand that, and they understand that very well, and they're taking advantage of it. This eruption, during a world distracted by a pandemic and a United States distracted by elections, is no coincidence. However, this fight, which has been brewing for decades, is also a distraction tool employed by the Azerbaijani government to maintain morale amongst issues within their own borders, including a brutal economic crisis and election chaos, as President Ilham Aliyev dissolved parliament and silenced all opposition before being re-elected for the 17th year. Throughout his leadership, Aliyev has actively used Armenians as a scapegoat, spreading armenophobia through state-sponsored racism. What Azerbaijan is trying to employ is that there is institutional racism in Azerbaijan, um, that whatever happens, the Armenians are to be blamed. Mm -hmm. And this is also giving a legitimacy for them, because, like, for example, let's talk about the uh, Middle East. If there was no uh, something called a Palestinian israeli conflict, there would not be uh, any, dictate, any dictator or authoritarian regime in the Middle East, like started from Syria to Iran, because the Palestinian conflict is giving them legitimacy. Similar to many Middle Eastern dictatorships and other dictatorships around the world, faith in these regimes are built on their hostile attitude and policies towards an external enemy. I think that what Azerbaijan tried to do with this is first to provoke, an Armenian full-scale invasion because we have the energy security component and we can talk maybe about the pipelines and so on. And the second was that to capture Armenian territories and then impose uh, pressure uh, on Pashinyan's... Uh, Leverage. Uh, yeah. Yes, saying that, you know, okay, you should now come to negotiations, otherwise I will not give you this land. Or we can try to give you this land and then you will try to compromise and give us some land in nagorno karabakh The uh, the Azerbaijanis that were, after the, the war of, in nagorno karabakh or they left uh, the region, 
they still didn't get Azerbaijan citizenship. They are refugees. Mm-hmm. And uh, Aliyev is using this card in the international community saying that, you know, I have one million refugees. Actually, it's not one million because 400,000 were Armenian refugees. I think the only solution can be, a, unfortunately, a big war like it happened in uh, between 1990 and 1994 and mm-hmm. the both sides will uh, change the status quo. It's as though Yerya predicted the situation we are now in. Though the outbreak of a full-on attack by Azerbaijan was a surprise for many Armenians, one aspect of it was not. A lot of this racism against Armenians points back to Turkey, as Turkey's President Erdogan, who has also conveniently been in power for 17 years and actively denies the Armenian genocide, views Azerbaijan as a Turkic brother country, often describing the two as one nation with two states. Two states that are collectively working towards something called pan-Turkism. The ideology one is uh, of neo-Ottoman expansion. It's an imperialistic mindset. It is to have as much power and as much dominance in the region as possible by any means, at the cost of anything, at the cost of life, human life, and specifically Armenian life. Um, Erdogan has recently begun to ramp up his need and his want to increase Turkey's leverage on the international playing field. Everywhere. That is specifically why Turkey has asked, Turkey has asked themselves, and Azerbaijan for them, have asked to be uh, one of the mediators in this process, along with France, U.S., and Russia. And it's insane to me to think about the nation that tried to wipe the Armenian people off the earth is now being asked to have a role in shaping what would be the you know future of that nation. No, no imperial power has that ability, but to even have a seat at that table for those discussions, Turkey does not deserve. One, I think as, as diasporans, we have this unique perspective where we're looking from outside to inside. And I don't think that that exists from like the Azerbaijani perspective because they don't have as large of a diaspora to do that. Um, I think that um, in terms of how the mindsets of some folks in Azerbaijan and the mindsets of some folks in Turkey are... Uh, or that's incredibly detrimental to the existential future of the Armenian nation. Now, I want to be mindful and I want to like note that not everybody feels that way or whatever. Of but what is important to note is that the leadership, the power structures of those countries, Krista, like you mentioned, are inherently racist. Yeah. That Erdogan is inherently a neo-Ottoman uh, poster child. That Aliyev is also his sideshow is his puppet to do whatever he wants and that pan-turkist neo-ottoman vision there's one thing that's gotten in its way for the last hundred years and it's the armenian state Mm -hmm. um and i think that the the that racism is seen through power structures just as much as it's seen through any individualistic you know human interaction armenia is the gate against any pan-turkist claims when it comes to russia and china if Armenia loses, the next step will be Russia and China. So both these countries, these major countries, should also see the conflict from this perspective. That is why they should support uh, Armenia. So that is why Armenia cannot compromise. But I don't, I do not have any vision or, let's say, how this conflict will be solved. It is very difficult. The pursuit of pan-Turkism includes the physical and political unification of Turkic nations stretching from Central Asia to Asia Minor. It therefore also directly involves the elimination of the one thing in their way, Armenia. The Republic of Armenia separates Turkey and Azerbaijan in creating this grand connection to Central Asia. Pan-Turkism is the ideological fuel for Turkish imperial ambition. The fuel that drove the young Turks to organize the Armenian genocide a century ago for a quote-unquote Turkey for the Turk is the same pan-Turkic fuel that drives the nationalist policies of Azerbaijan and Turkey to oppress its minorities until today for a purely Turkish nation with no diversity. Pan-Turkism is how they justify their imperial ambitions and racial superiority. Turkologists who are not taken seriously by any credible scholarship for the past century have espoused pseudoscientific theories to justify their racial superiority. Their outlandish claims include, for example, that the Hittites, Sumerians, Babylonians, ancient Egyptians 
are classified as being of Turkic origin, or two, that Turks were the first to migrate to America, or that the Indo-European languages, the languages of Europe, Iran, India, including Armenian, derived from Proto-Turkic. All of those pan-Turkic falsehoods, which includes the denial of the Armenian genocide, are taught from elementary to university-level schooling in countries like Turkey and Azerbaijan, where pan-Turkism is most prevalent. As anthropologist Victor Schnurlman explains, this view involves, quote, an appropriation of the Aryan past and, above all, a claim to the desired status of indigenous people, an appropriation of the right to a myth that has to surpass all the political myths. He also notes that such a view opens the door to racialization and potential racism, which we are seeing the results of today. The goals of pan-Turkism are just one reason why the Turkish and Azerbaijani governments are the aggressor in this conflict. So, why are we so keen on maintaining Artsakh? Because for Armenians, this is much bigger than just a dispute over land. It's much more existential. Losing Artsakh means being one step closer to losing Armenia, a reality we already faced once during the Armenian Genocide during which Armenians were displaced from roughly 85% of our historic homeland. When you lose that much, you're bound to hold on tighter to what's left. And their genocide wasn't finished. Their genocide was held off by our forces mm-hmm. at Sardarabad. Yeah. Their genocide was cut off by Armenians defending their homeland. That does not mean that they, ne- they necessarily stopped their will to eradicate the Armenian people yeah. and to be an existential threat to the Armenian nation. And it's being held off now on the front lines of Artsakh. This conflict is not only about Artsakh. It is about the fate of Armenia's very existence. As Monte Melkonyan, a famous diasporan Armenian general from the first Artsakh war said, if we lose Karabakh, we will turn the final page of Armenian history. No Armenian wakes up excited to talk about how people that they know have died from this conflict. No Armenian wakes up excited to talk about uh, their cathedrals being bombed. No Armenian wakes up excited to talk about casual mass casualties against civilians. These are not things that we're marching into war for. These are things that we are making our voices heard about. Because of this sense of urgency and subsequent lack of news coverage, 10 members of the Armenian Youth Federation held a hunger strike in front of the Los Angeles Federal Building. From October 26 through November 1st, these 10 individuals starved themselves to draw attention to this Armenian crisis. The speakers are Chris Simonyan, Ashod Vaskanyan, and Shant Atamyan, respectively. This is the least I could be doing. Um, with all the soldiers, what they're doing, this is not even anything comparable to what they're doing. And the kids, the 10, 11 year olds that have to bury their mothers and fathers or be displaced from their homes and live in bomb shelters, not know what they're going to eat the next day, not know if they're going to survive. So me doing a hunger strike is the least I could be doing. And I will definitely be trying to do more until the end. You can't choose what humanitarian right or what you think is right uh, to fight for if you're if you're a humanitarian you have to fight for everything that's humanitarian not just the ones that affect you directly here on your land why do you care as an armenian american about Artsakh? oh because it's my homeland um uh, i was an immigrant from there not by, not by my own choice but by the will of my parents um i feel like it's my right to not only fight for my country but fight for what's right um doesn't matter if it's my country or my neighbor's country. If it's if it's the right thing to do, you should always do it. It's it's painful. It hurts. I mean, we're I'm 18 years. I'm 20 years old, and I'm here doing a hunger strike. And every, the entire community is coming out, and they're telling us, "Oh, you guys are so brave. You're doing this. You're doing that. You guys are doing so much for this community." But at the same time, when we get that praise, and you give back, and you, you think back to the same kids that are my age and even younger who are literally throwing their lives away and giving their lives to fight for their nation and fight for what's right. And they're the real heroes. If Azerbaijan puts down their weapons, there will be peace. If Armenians don't defend themselves in Artsakh, they will no longer exist. Azerbaijan is playing actually the victim card, saying that, you know, Azerbaijan is a victim. But the problem is that they are the aggressive. It's no surprise that Turkey, who has been gaslighting us for over a century over the truth about the Armenian Genocide, is hand-in-hand supporting the Azeri victim narrative. With no shame or integrity, Erdogan said to the world upon the outbreak of this conflict that Armenia, Armenia, a small country of 3 million, and Artsakh with only 150,000 people, and the diaspora, 
as its sole allies, is the biggest threat to regional stability. Yeah, and I think one should ask Turkey and Azerbaijan why Armenia has such a large diaspora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that seems to be their big... Two nations with almost a combined population of 100 million people are complaining about the fact that there happens to be a large diaspora speaking out about their war crimes and their attempts of genocide. And the question is why? Why do they exist? Why are there people in LA? Why are there people in New York? Why are there people in London? Who drove these people out of their lands? I remember that uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan, he brought the idea to prepare the people of both countries peacefully or there should be a peaceful transition. Yes, this is important, but actually this is concerning because we cannot bring peace in the army or prepare the Armenians for peace, but the Azerbaijanis are being prepared for war. It should be a both side, or it should be a mutual uh, component that the Azerbaijanis also should prepare themselves uh, for peace. The first Artsakh war didn't end in the 90s. It's obvious that Armenia was never in a state of peace, and to pretend it was may have been one of our leadership's major failures in securing our homeland and the security of our people, for peace in Armenia and Artsakh. It just feels like there were so many signs. Constant ceasefire violations, an increasingly aggressive Turkey and Azerbaijan with more and more military expenditure in new tech and hardware, military games and drills. As Yerya mentioned earlier, Aliyev has been attempting to provoke Armenia for decades. A world distracted prompted these two fragile dictatorships to focus in on a pan-Turkic opportunity to solidify their regimes. We have always been at the whim of the empires who surround us, using our existential struggles for their grander geopolitical positioning and greed. Specifically, in the context of the Caucasus, for the past few centuries, it's always been between the Turks and the Russians. Whether it was 150 years ago, World War I, or today. What's different, however, what's changed these past five or so years relative to the 25 years before it since the first Artsakh War, is none other than the expansionist militarism and unchecked aggression of Turkey's President Erdogan. Actually, the last couple of months, things have been changed, uh, not just in South Caucasus, but also in the whole region, the Middle East also, because these two regions are, I, I mean, I always say they are interconnected when it comes to geopolitics and energy security. Um, so I tried to actually uh, draw zone uh, in the region. We have the Southern Caucasus zone, we have now the Levantine zone, mm -hmm. uh, and the Eastern Mediterranean zone. So these three zones are interconnected because in these three zones, Turkey is trying to flex its muscles. Mm -hmm. um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, we had the Libyan uh, case and we had the struggle there between Russia, uh, Turkey and its proxies. Mm -hmm. and now we have also the Greek conflict uh, uh, in the Asia and see whether if there will be a war or a clash between the Greeks and the Turks. Uh, we have the Levantian zone that is uh, northern Syria, especially in Idlib, and maybe we can add northern Lebanon because the Turkish ships the ones is in increase uh, there also. Yeah. And we have finally uh, the southern Caucasus uh, zone where there is a struggle between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And lately, Azerbaijan realized that it can no more trust the Russians because the Russians also they are arming Armenia and they are the allies. I mean, we have military alliance between Armenia and uh, Russia. So they are trying to put all their eggs in the Turkish uh, basket. I am not uh, surprised of it because the Turkish influence also uh, is increasing uh, in the region and the balance of power has been shifted to some access towards Turkey. So this also provoked a war because Azerbaijan uh, realized or thought that Turks uh, will support them in, uh, in the future. Well, that is why uh, this war the, that happened in July 12 was provoked also by the right of uh, Turkey in the region. Turkey is currently in conflict, militarily and politically, with almost 10 of its neighbors. From Iran's perspective, Iran all, always supports the international law mm -hmm. in the region, saying that it supports the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, but also prefers negotiation over the country. This is like very normal. If I was Iran, I would do the same. Everyone says that, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yes. But from Iran's perspective, um, the victory of Armenia is a victory for Iran because Iran sees things from its 
conflict with Israel. Uh, we know that Azerbaijan is a strategic partner for Israel and the drones were Israeli-made drones and there is also the presence of Israeli intelligence in Azerbaijan. So a victory of Azerbaijan means a victory for Israel in the region. Mm-hmm. And this is very concerning um, from the Iranian perspective because now Iran is surrounded uh, by U.S. forces and also the sanctions and everything. So any defeat in Armenia means a defeat of its project in the uh, region. In addition to the pressure of having Israeli military equipment flying over the Iranian border, Iran also doesn't like that Turkey has brought thousands of Sunni jihadi mercenaries who were just fighting Iranian-backed forces in Syria now to their northern border. However, even with all these potential threats to Iran's security, They remain neutral on paper since there are about 20 million ethnic Azeris living in northern Iran. They must be delicate as to what they do in order to avoid their own Azerbaijani uprising within their nation. While the conflict this fall raged on, Putin was keen to note that Russia values both of its Armenian and Azerbaijani citizens living in Russia as equals, reminding the rest of us that there are just as many Azeris as there are Armenians in Russia, and that Russia wants to continue to be a neutral mediator to the conflict. From the Russian perspective, the Russians always they use, uh, they try to use the stick and carrot strategy. Uh, the conflict is in uh, interest because as long as there is a conflict uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, it means that these two states need uh, Russia to solve. It means more Russian presence in the region. But mainly, uh, let's say Azerbaijan is trying to decrease its dependence from Russia and tries to increase its dependence more from Turkey, and this is concerning. Mm. If Azerbaijan like buys Turkish drones or Turkish military uh, technology and so on, and this is concerning because it means that Russia is uh, losing its leverage uh, on Azerbaijan. However, as the events unfolded, it became clear Russia was not willing to pick a side when it came to a full-on war over Artsakh. It is not in the interest of Russia to see a war because Russia is now involved in Belarus, it is involved in Syria, it is involved in even Libya. So it is not in the interest of Russia to open a new front in South Caucasus against Turkey. Um, mm-hmm. At the same time, there is the energy component because it is not in the interest of even Europe to see a war and to see the, this partner destroyed because it means they will invest there again. Uh, so they will put more money and also they will see to uh, diversify the energy routes from Caucasus. It means that Azerbaijan will lose leverage on uh, Europe. That is why it's a risky, but still we don't know because we don't know that uh, the balance or the regional balance in which direction will go. If it will go to a Turkey, then it means a new war will happen. Mm-hmm. If there is a clash between the Turks and uh, Russians in Syria, definitely... Uh, Turkey will push Azerbaijan to open a new front uh, just to weaken the Russians in the Caucasus. Azerbaijan is a huge oil and natural gas exporter, with pipelines that head west supplying Turkey, Israel, and a number of other key nations that rely on their energy trade with Azerbaijan. There is also the energy security component here, I mean, because these pipelines were very, very close to the conflict area. And now, after after 2020, um, Azerbaijan replaced Russia in pumping oil and gas to Turkey. So this is concerning. It means that Russia is becoming out from the games, so Russia will do its best to balance the conflict uh, in the region. I think in, in terms of energy trade, Europe is much more reliant on Azerbaijan for its energy than the U.S., but it is important to note what that energy money buys you. And it buys you the ability to have PR firms, it buys you the ability to pay off, again, reports that you can cite and look up yourself. Slush funds set aside by the Azeri government to pay off diplomats in Europe to be silent on issues like Artsakh. That is, that is the disparity here that we need to note. That oil money, though it might not have a direct connection to the United States, it has a direct connection into the tangible results that are put out into the world on the people that are bought off, on the media firms that are bought off, on the politicians that are bought off. And that's part of what we're fighting against. Unfortunately, we've seen the convincing power of oil money, even in the United States. Um, I think it's important to uh, have some historical context so that we can see how what their position is and how their position has evolved uh, throughout the course of this conflict. Um, in 1992, 
uh, the United States uh, signed the Freedom Support Act, which helped uh, Soviet uh, na- post-Soviet nations uh, going into democracy. And in that uh, act, Section 907, there's a specific prohibition for uh, an end to or an, a complete embargo of military sales and military aid to Azerbaijan, uh, specifically so that it's not used and targeted against the people of Armenia. Mm-hmm. However... After 2001, uh, in 911, 9/11. yeah, after uh, the U.S. began its campaign on the war and terror, um, in 2002, the United States made an amendment to that resolution that said that they can now give money and su- military support to Azerbaijan if it's classified as a anti-terroristic measure. Mm. So, throughout the years, we've seen uh, this. Um, aid that's supposed to be going to Azerbaijan to help with those quote-unquote anti-terroristic measures, we've seen it balloon uh, to the point where up to last year, uh, there was over $100 million in aid sent from the U.S. government to the government of Azerbaijan. And we're not talking about $100 million in humanitarian aid, developmental aid. Right. We're talking about $100 million earmarked for military aid specifically. Um, it there's lots of statements that have come out from the United States, from Pompeo, from the Trump administration, but none of them speak louder than the money that is going mm-hmm. to fund the Azeri dictatorial regime that is then turning that money to attack and bomb Armenians to commit war crimes in Artsakh. Along with an increase in military aid to Azerbaijan, we've seen a substantial decrease in both military and nation-building or humanitarian aid to Armenia over the last four years. That's the money that's allocated towards Armenia. However, the United States legislative branch, the, the Congress, allocates money specifically for projects like the Halo Trust that are supposed to help demine a right. lot of these areas that were you know, affected during the war and like even till today, there's kids that running around, run on post-Soviet from 1991, 1990, these mines that haven't exploded, and they, there's loss of life, there's injury, whatever. Right. Even that aid this year was cut by the United States. Why would they cut? That's insane. On the pretense, per the State Department, for preparing the populations for peace. By keeping so, more bombs on the ground? <laughs> so, yeah, so we're seeing that there's this moral disparity in what's being said and what's happening. The United States wants to prepare populations for peace as it sends $100 million in military aid to Azerbaijan, and it wants to prepare populations for peace as it pulls m- vital money that and resources that go to demining we're not talking about military aid we're talking about demining yeah. so kids running around in the homelands in their own homeland can't die from mines like this isn't there's this very very stark disparity here um and i think that's what it, that's why it matters for the united states because it's a testament to who we are as a nation artsakh is already a self-determined state with a functioning government That's important to note because although not yet internationally recognized as such, this point cannot be overlooked when discussing Artsakh. Artsakh is a better democracy than Azerbaijan is, and that's not some hyperbole or Armenian line. Artsakh elections are, comparatively to elections in Azerbaijan, much more free and much more open. Mm -hmm. And Artsakh's government is self-functioning and self-sustaining, all of which are pretenses for by law, international law, for self-determination, to have a functioning government, to have a self-determined state. And as Americans, why that's important to us is because we, on the international stage, talk about our ability to intervene and to make statements on all these issues because we are the champions of democracy, right? We are the ones that bring, like, uh, talk about how all of these countries in the Middle East need to be more democratic, how we need to pursue the, the ideals of democracy around the world. Now we have a people that have personified it. We have a people that have asked to be self-determined. We have a people that are exemplifying that today. And our inability to speak out and speak up for those people says so much about our values, about what we really stand for. Is it our diplomatic ties to countries or economic ties to countries like uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan that's important? Or is it our values and our morals as a nation that we self 
state that we say that these are the things that define America, the ability to be free, the ability to be democratic. Those things are missing. Um, and if we are we don't have the ability to stand up for them, then we don't have the ability to say that we are the bearers of that democracy on the world stage. How could the United States help the situation in the Caucasus right now? Well, the United States is one of the strongest countries in the world, so they have tons of ways they can help. Um, but the main way we want them to help is not by war, not by violence, not by infiltration, not by soldiers. Um, the one thing I want is very peaceful resolution to this. Um, I, I feel like a very peaceful resolution would be to, uh, first of all, sanction Turkey and Azerbaijan and hold them accountable for the crimes they're committing, uh, war crimes specifically. And, of course, the recognition of Arsakh because that is uh, very valuable and important um, for us to have uh, as an international recognized country. Do you think your American friends that are not Armenian are aware of what's going on in Armenia right now in Artsakh? Um, I would say to an extent. There are a decent amount who um, who have, so whenever they have Armenian friends, they're, um, they're getting kept up to date, they're being told what's going on. But at the same time, I believe that they... The, it's, it's really hard to really give 100% to something that doesn't affect you directly. And I understand that in their position, but I also yeah. feel like as a, a human and someone who understands, who has, who has ever been wronged in any way, shape, or form in their life should understand that they should support people who are going through a, a, a great discomfort in their life. I think, one, uh, we have to have a definition of who gets to have a say in American policy. And that involves all um, Ar Americans, which means all American citizens, which means that it involves Armenian American citizens who have an agency in their country and in their voice um, to state how they feel. So as Armenian American citizens, we are inherently against the fact that our taxpayer money goes to fund and pay for the military ventures of a regime that is, again, committing war crimes against our people. It's showing aggression against our people. So one, we are those Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, for America, it's, it, it, it's about who we are as a nation. Right, our values. If, yeah, if we are so willing to enter into Iraq and into all these conflicts on the pretense, on the pretense that we are going to help stabilize and bring democracy to make people's voices heard on self-determination, then why are we not even lifting our voice for the people of Artsakh? We were willing to start wars over these pretenses, mm. but we are silent now. Uh, and that, that failure in leadership is what we're seeing play out. That's why you have some of the countries that we've mentioned, Russia, France, playing such a bigger role. That's why Macron is going and, and taking such a strong stance. That's why Erdogan feels like he can do what he wants because there's a lack of leadership from the so-called world powers or the police. One, there's a stark disparity in terms of how both, all, actually all three of these countries are run. Armenia, as a democratically elected president. Artsakh has a democratically elected president. Azerbaijan has a dictator whose father was in charge of the country, whose familial line has held that country for over 30 years. Erdogan, on the other hand, is an autocrat who every time he loses an election, reruns one yeah. or uh, it imposes his will through jailing, jailing journalists. Really? And if you want to see for yourself, Google the human rights record and the journalistic rights record of Azerbaijan and Turkey. And you can see who is trying to uh, shut out the truth and who is trying to open a door to it. There's a reason why uh, when this conflict started, Azerbaijan didn't allow yeah. foreign reporters to come in off the bat. Armenia, the first thing it said was our doors are open for mm -hmm. anyone who wants to come see what's happening here. Yeah. There's yeah. one regime trying to shout out the light. Sh I mean... Uh, close out the light and there's another True. trying to shed light. In addition to widespread and deep-rooted propaganda from Aliyev and Erdogan, there's also been a lack of media coverage back in the West. Like looking back on when this conflict started, the, the military aggression from a couple of weeks ago, the first thing that the government of Azerbaijan did was shut down 
internet servers so that mm. people could not communicate effectively. One of the first things the Armenian government did was tell people to go on social media and speak out about this. Right. Um, and I don't think anyone's word should be taken over anybody else's. I think the truth should speak above everything and everybody should have the right and the ability to see that truth in itself. And I think Armenia exemplifies that by saying we are welcoming and allowing journalists in and Azerbaijan exemplifies the denial of truth, the shutting out of truth by not letting foreign press in, by having like media, out, by sharing misinformation, by sh sharing right. propaganda. And I think it's an important point that you brought up that a lot of the voices speaking out on the Armenian end are things that have sprouted out from the ground. Yeah. They're grassroots efforts. A lot of the voices speaking on the Azeri end are diplomats and paid PR firms that get them airtime. When we have hundreds of thousands of people protesting in the streets and all they can produce is a consul general to give a statement. We as Armenians are so connected to this issue because it's our homeland and we're keeping up with it day to day. It takes time for journalists to get on the ground. It takes time for journalists to tell their stories. Produce, it, yeah. takes, it takes time for the narrative to come out. And I'm actually a believer that the narrative is coming out. I think so. And, and I'm a believer in that uh, the more folks that go to Azerbaijan, I, and I want, folk, I want journalists to be in Azerbaijan so that yeah. they can see how that government runs that country, and the more folks that are in Stepanakert, the same journalists that were bombed out of Stepanakert, their stories are coming out, and they're taking a, a very strong stance against the war crimes. I mean, if you look at some of the recent pieces, Vice sent a team there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Their team had to evacuate. They had to evacuate because it wasn't even safe for journalists to be within Artsakh. So what does that say about the value of human life? If journalists know that there's no guarantee for their safety and freedom, what does that say if I'm a resident of Artsakh? What does that say if I'm not a military uh, person in Artsakh, right? Human, uh, it, it's a war crime to target civilians. So if there are journalists leaving in fear of their lives, what does that say about the indiscriminate targeting of human beings by Azerbaijan. And I think all of these things, all these war crimes, all these issues, all uh, everything that the Aliyev regime represents, in time, I think the more folks that we get on the ground to see it, the truth will tell itself. We have been seeing understating headlines that feed into false equivalencies. For example, an edited BBC headline read, Armenia accuses Azerbaijan of targeting cathedral, as if implying it was potentially someone else or Armenians themselves that did it. A New York Times headline read, When Armenia talked tough, Azerbaijan took action, as if to imply Armenia was the instigator. I think there is this um, inherent need to, uh, when approaching an issue, and again, we're talking about from a non-Armenian perspective, mm -hmm. to get both perspectives in. However, we have to understand that there's a difference between both pers perspectives and drawing false equivalencies and right. false parodies. So there is an Azerbaijani uh, uh, perspective, there's an Armenian perspective, of course. but there's one nation aggressively, uh, indiscriminately bombing civilians. There's one nation that started this. There's one nation bringing in jihadists. There's one nation collaborating with Turkey. There's one nation that has 10 million in population with a partner that has another 90 million in population. And there's one nation with 3 million population. So it's about seeing the facts and the truth. It's, a, it's not about perspective. It's about analyzing and cont contextualizing this entire conflict. There's also one nation rampaging the internet with bots in an attempt to occupy the narrative and scare people and even celebrities away from speaking up about that truth, while Armenians remain trying to amplify the reality. I don't see any Armenian Twitter campaigns going after, personally going after, like, Azerbaijanis and folks like that. I, I personally, myself, have never commented on, like, you know, uh, an Azerbaijani person posting something. It is this like uh, reactive process that we see where, and much of it, um, and you can uh, kind of cite the recent Facebook article that came out citing the ten, over 10,000 accounts linked to bots, linked uh, Troll to- Troll farms, whatever yeah, they're called. That, all of which were 
run by and had Connected some influence the by the government. Yeah. All of those were shut down. So to say that there aren't Azerbaijani voices on Twitter or it's only Armenians, that it, that's not factually correct. However, there is a disinformation campaign. There are vast amounts of bots. There are vast amounts of paid voice paid the same way they bring in mercenaries is the same way that they get their voice heard they these are paid voices whether they're bots or people uh to speak out for this now that doesn't say doesn't mean that there aren't real Azeris that are concerned about this or have their own stance i'm saying that it's disproportionate with genocide level fears provoking panic in armenians around the world it's hard to wonder how we can help but the Armenian community has been doing an inspiring amount of work to raise awareness and money for Armenia. The hostilities were brought to a halt on November 10th, as Russia and Turkey imposed their imperialistic will upon the Artsakh Sea. As Azerbaijan, with all its military might and allied support, were pushing deeper into the mountains and towards Shushi, the symbolic capital of Artsakh, the Armenian leadership sought to end the increasingly dire struggle for Artsakh in order to preserve the Armenian presence there. Russia would not fight with Armenia for Artsakh, while Turkey was fully behind the Azerbaijani attack. And so it seems the Artsakh struggle has been set back. The Armenian population and their cultural heritage are at more risk than ever before, as control over the republic is currently changing. We will expand on the developing situation in a future episode, as time will tell what the fate of Artsakh will end up becoming. In the meantime, what can we do? Well, just as we've done in the last few months. Stay tuned in. Keep bringing awareness to the issues. Join and support your local organizations, some of which have incredibly impactful homeland initiatives, like AYF's With Our Soldiers, which focuses on providing aid and monetary support to veterans and their families, and is currently committed to helping cover the medical costs of injured veterans, as well as providing relief to the inhabitants of the border regions of Artsakh and Armenia, impacted by Azerbaijan's unprovoked military aggression. I know at times as a diasporan, folks feel helpless. Folks feel like they're watching something that they can't have an effect on from thousands of miles away. But I promise you that you have agency as a diasporan wherever you're living, especially in the United States. You have agency, you have voice, you have the ability to affect policy. Now, that doesn't come overnight. That doesn't come in a week. But that does come through the building of critical mass. Um, And that's what we need to do as Armenians. There are organizations that work on these things Mm 24-7. Go to the ANCA website. Sign up to be a rapid responder. Put your emails in there so that once there are policy changes that are being called upon once there are uh, movements that we want to make on a legislative level that your voice is part of that wider movement that your voice is being heard and on top of that don't stop speaking out don't stop sharing the stories of our folks in the homeland don't stop amplifying the voices of our folks in the homeland while you might not be there you can help amplify their voice and i think that's one of the strongest powers in our arsenal that we have and we have to as a diaspora utilize it the struggle for artsakh has changed over the past few months a hard-fought struggle to exist or goyamard in armenian against an oil-rich dictatorship supplied and supported by nato's second largest military turkey has placed the future of Artsakh's independence at risk of existing. However, the fight for Artsakh's justice has entered a new phase. Their fight for self-determination will never end as long as the Armenian in Artsakh demands justice, equality, and the right to live with dignity on their homeland. Never stop bringing awareness. Never stop demanding justice, doing everything you can to develop and improve the lives of the people in Artsakh who the world has forsaken. If we don't talk about it, If we don't work for it, no one else will. We continue to rely on ourselves with an awakened sense of purpose and action. The diaspora is the only ally Armenia and Artsakh can depend on. We look forward to continuing our conversations on Artsakh to raise awareness and to learn as much as we can as the bearers of our nation's memory through the coming centuries. In the diaspora, lyrics like Mamjan Chodukhres, Shad Chumadadzes are a reflection of the past especially before the recent shift in our borders. But in Artsakh, these words are a reflection of a very real present, now more real than ever before. Yes, our borders have been redrawn. Yes, it hurts in ways words cannot describe. Our people know pain all too well. We come from a beautiful yet tragic history, but against all odds, we survived a genocide. 
Against all odds, we are still here. Against all odds, we will not give up, and despite all odds, we are not going anywhere. Artsakh is as much a part of Hayasan as Yerevan, as Sasun, as Ararat. Being pushed out of our lands in 1915 made us all citizens of the world, bound not by borders, but by blood. And there is no better example of that power than witnessing the heart of Artsakh. Thank you so much for listening to the first episode of Haituk Talks, the official podcast of the AYF. I'm Krista Marina Apardian. And I'm Haik Minasian. And we're just a couple of Armenians. Talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Go ahead. Try to destroy them.